the 20th chapter of Luke, we drop our eyes upon a very famous parable, a super parable, if you may say that, of the parables of Christ. It deals with the vineyard. The parable of the vineyard is a main, it's a, it's a, it's a super parable, I call it, because there's so much truth that, that plays into and is able to be explained from this parable. We're going to look at this parable in its entirety tonight. We're looking at a summary statement that shows the importance of how to get the victory in a time and in a situation that is shown by this parable. Let's read the parable and make that point clear to our minds. We should know this, and again, if you have not understood this parable and want to go back, there's a parable on our YouTube channel called The Lord's Vineyard. And in that parable, teaching, sermon, you can understand the whole understanding, both past, present, and future of this parable. We're in Luke 20 and verse 10. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Luke 20 and verse 10. <clears throat> Let's examine what it says here. It says, and at the season he sent a servant. This is the parable of the vineyard, where a vineyard was made, and there was fruit to be received, and there were husbands even given the job of tending and taking care of the vineyard and bringing fruit to the mass in his time. Verse 11 says, verse 10, pardon me. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen, <clears throat> that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. The husband was to give the master of the vineyard his own fruit in season. He sent a servant, it says, but the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. Here is a master, an owner of the vineyard, one that planted it and gave individuals the job, the position of taking care of it and receiving the fruit for himself. He sent a servant to receive that fruit and they beat that servant, sent him away empty. Verse 11, and again, the master sent another servant and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty, no fruit. Verse 12, and again he sent a third, and he wounded him also, and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my what? Beloved my beloved son, it may be they will reverence him when they see him. Can we understand what this parable means just from this last text alone? What does this vineyard represent? represents God's people, Israel at that time, but also God's church. Who do these servants represent that are coming at different seasons to ask for God's fruit or true fruit to be seen? Who are these servants seen in different times coming, being sent by God to receive fruit from the people of God? Messengers, who? The prophets, the servants of God sent throughout different times that were beaten and shamefully despised and sent away empty at their different season. God says, surely the reverence who? My, my son. The son will say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish. God sent his son. And here this parallel of this prophecy, of this parallel or this parable, go together to show us what happened anciently as God showed, even at the time of Christ, how the very Jews of old that knew this parable from the Old Testament we're fulfilling it even in their time. It goes on and says this. Verse 14. But when the husband saw him or saw the son, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us do what? Come, let us kill him. That his inheritance or that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? But it says, what will happen to those that will kill the Son of God and cast him out of his own vineyard, the, the inheritance and vineyard, and destroy him, like they did the prophets. Notice what it says. Even clearly it says in verse 16, he shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, what? Those who in their very heart had reason to kill Christ. Those that in their very heart had reason to stop the movement of revival information. Those in their very heart that despised the idea of having a home church system or calling these people that had them of the devil. These very people said, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid that he would do exactly as he said. God forbid that the word of God would come to pass. God forbid that it's prophesied some would come and receive fruit. God forbid that we, even though we are unjust stewards, would be cast out of the stewardship. They said, God forbid. Now notice where we are. Before we look at anything else, notice where we are in this parable. 
If this parable dealt with and showed us the time of Christ, is this only for the time of Christ? Because, brother, sister, let me ask you a question. Will the beloved son come again? Does he have a vineyard today? Is he seeking fruit? Are there husbandmen in place today that must give an account of their stewardship? And so likewise, this parable not only dealt with the time of Christ, it's dealt with every generation. And it's dealt especially even for these last days. It's showing us a message of those who are in the vineyard of God that should have fruit in their season and that they know the husbandman is coming and they're reasoning their minds various ways that they could remove the beloved son from his inheritance. And when it comes to the prophecy being fulfilled, the moon of revival information we've been preaching and hearing about the spirit of prophecy, the idea of God finishing the work, the concert message of all the believers in various time, languages, various ways, is God forbid that revival information should come. God forbid the three message we have is work in our hearts or in the world. God forbid that this ability we have to eat of the fruit and take of the money will come to an end. God forbid that these things will come to an end and we'll be put out of the stewardship. Jesus says, there's only one solution in this scenario. God does not intend to try and turn back the hand of time and redo something in these last days. God will finish your work, but he puts it down to a very simple equation that's in the parable here in verse 17 and 18. Look at Luke 20, verse 17 and 18. Here are the sum of the matter. Here is where we are in 2018. Here's where we are with the NAD and the GC at variance with each other. Here we are. With, you have false prophets in the self-supporting line as well as the conference line. Here we are when we have individuals that don't have a true understanding of spirituality, whether they call on, read, or teach Bible spirit of prophecy or whether they don't. We have a situation where now there are individuals in God's great vineyard, no matter how they may reckon or call themselves, that do not have fruit, do not show fruit, do not have any desire of giving God fruit when it comes to their ministry coming to an end, or what they call a ministry. It comes to the idea of them not being able to continue in these false paths and leading others astray. Their only sentiment is, God, forgive me? Oh no. God forbid. And God says, the parable says, Jesus said unto us, there's only one true solution to the situation that I'm bringing not only to the church of God 2,000 years ago that would soon come to a sweeping away of the structure. I'm coming down to 2018. I'm coming down to the last days when I, the beloved son, will come again. And this same scenario will play itself out. And I'm coming to look for fruit again. And here is the sum of the matter equated down to two short verses, which shows us today what we should focus on even in these last days. Let's examine it. It's the subject of our topic. Or I missed it tonight. In Luke 20, verse 17 and 18, it says this. Luke 20 and 17. It said, and he beheld them and said, what is this then? In other words, looking at all we've seen before and this understanding, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. What is that scripture? Now, did the Jews know what the scripture was? Yes. They know where it was. Yes. They understand the true import of it. No. They have a real understanding of its true prophetic import? No. They have a right application of where they were in relation to the stone? No. And because of that, this scripture will unlock for us tonight spiritual truths that we really want to be able to not be among those that Jesus says, according to verse 16, when he comes, he'll destroy. And he's going to give this vineyard to others. Brother Sister says, Verse 18 says this. Here's the sum of the matter. Whose service shall fall upon that stone? What stone is he talking about? The same stone of verse 17. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. But upon or on whomsoever it or the stone shall fall, it shall well grind him to powder. Now, brother, sister, look at this, 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 this situation in two points. You see, one, the stone will be an agency by which someone will fall upon it and be what? Broken. Broken. The other, they will not fall upon this stone, but the stone will fall upon them and they'll be ground to? Power. Now, what is easier to put together? Something that's broken in a few pieces or something that's ground to powder and pulverized? Which is easier to put together? 
Brothers and sisters, when you look at the idea of those that are broken, as opposed to those that are basically destroyed, here we see a mystery set before us. A understand that we must use the scriptures to understand tonight to see what is the solution to the situation we see in God's church in 2018. God's church even now. Whether you talk about self-supporting or it don't make any difference. That's all God's church. Everyone that has a profession of the three in his message, a profession of present truth, they are part of God's church no matter who recognizes them. They are part, whether they're false prophets, whether they're nominal Adventists, whether they're truth, it don't make any difference. They're all like an ancient Israel. Although the whole Israel went apostate, they all were reckoned and all were judged by God in their season. Here in Luke 20, we see God summarize what the solution to this situation is in two verses. He says, I want you in 2018, not those in, 20, in 2,000 years ago. He says, right now, are you in the vineyard? Are you supposed to bring forth fruit? Is God coming to see whether you would give that fruit or in your lifestyle, in your habits, in your action, or lack thereof? Are you killing the cruci or crucifying the Savior and destroying his prophets? He's asking you the question, have you ever considered the scripture that said the stone which the builder rejected the same is become the head of the corner? This rejected stone is the main stone upon which God will build. He says in verse 18, Whoso shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. Now, brothers and sisters, a cornerstone is not used to break things. A cornerstone is used to build things. So when you look at this idea of falling upon this stone, when you fell upon this stone, you were falling upon it that you could be building up. So there's more here than we look. But again, it says that those that reject this stone, whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Oh, brothers and sisters, we see a divine mystery. And we're going to understand that the sum and total of what we should focus on tonight is summed up in the phrase, how shall, or I should say, how we should be falling on the rock and being broken. What is it to fall upon the rock and be broken. Now, let's examine verse 18 as we open up this message carefully tonight. When we look at this phrase, falling upon the rock and being broken. What is this falling upon the rock? From what we've seen thus far without looking at any other scriptures, we can say one thing. According to this scripture, there are going to be two people, two classes of people. Can we see that? Of all these husbandmen, there are going to be two classes of people. Now, we find out that there's a class that are unfaithful, and they're going to be put out of the stewardship and destroyed. Do we see that? Right there in Scripture. Also, the Bible says that the vineyard will be given to others. So there's another class. Those unfaithful, destroyed, removed from stewardship. Those that are found to be faithful, given the vineyard, and given a work to do. Two classes, amen? One, it says, fall upon the rock. And are what? Broken. Another, the rock falls upon them, or the stone falls upon them, and they are ground the powder. And the Bible says that this stone, this rock, is a chief cornerstone, not a stone for breaking in itself, it's a stone for building. Let's examine that. Because according to the scripture, unless we are broken by this stone, we are useless in the kingdom of God. We have no use or worth. Our worth is void. It's invalid in the summing up of God's history and the finish of the gospel work and the resolution of the gospel. We have no work unless we fall upon this rock, finding our place in the vineyard and saved forevermore. Now, brothers, can we consider that scripture? Jesus said, have you ever heard the scripture that says the stone that was, re was rejected is the head? Where is that, stone, that scripture found in the New Testament? It's found in 1 Peter. It's found in the Old Testament, of course, but it's found in the New Testament. And when we look at the New Testament in 1 Peter, 1 Peter explains to us why Jesus said in the parable, 
hey, examine the scripture to understand what we should be doing in this time or what's the very essential thing that we need in this time or this last element of the church. In 1 Peter, says this, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, verse 6 to 8. In 1 Peter 2, verse 6 to 8, let's examine the scripture dealing with this chief cornerstone and see what Peter, under the inspiration of God, says to us is the secret of this parable and the solution for the church in the last days. How shall we fall upon the rock and be broken? How shall we be the inheritors of God's vineyard and not be destroyed but be saved? How shall we have the elements of our nature broken up and not us be ground and destroyed even unto powder? In 1 Peter 2, verse 6 through 8, the Bible says this. Let's just see what this scripture means to us in the last days. 1 Peter 2, verse 6 through 8. It says this. In 1 Peter 2, and verse 6, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's the church, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be... Now stop right there. We found out that what should we do to this, this, this rock? Fall on it. Fall on it. Those that fall upon it or that see this stone and don't reject it. Because remember, some builders rejected. Didn't want it. Cast it outside the city and, and destroy it. Some will fall upon it. The Bible says this falling upon it or being in connection with the stone is what? Look at verse 6. They see it as elect. They see it as precious. They also do what? Believe on him. And they shall not be what? Confounded. Confounded. These individuals that are in connection with the stone, or we understand something of this being connected with the stone, shows faith. Do they believe? Falling on this rock is impossible without what? Without faith. And those that have the faith to connect themselves with this stone, shall not be confused, shall not be confounded in the last days. They will have a sure foundation for their feet. The Bible says they'll see him or Christ as precious. They will see him as elect. They shall believe on him. They shall not be confounded. Remember, there's two groups. Look at verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. That's verse 7. <clears throat> but unto them, second group, two groups, Second group, but unto them that are disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same has become the head of the? So, brother said, we see two groups. Amen. We see two groups. One that fall upon the rock, broken. One that the rock falls upon and they are destroyed or ground to powder. Those that fall upon the rock are those, or build upon the rock, or upon the rock, are those that believe, have faith. And those that reject this rock are those that are, not only don't have faith, but they're disobedient. Even, the Bible says this, verse 8, and a stone of stumbling, what do, you do? what do you do when you stumble? You fall. But not upon the rock, you fall and the rock falls upon you. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even and then the stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were as steward in the vineyard to be caretakers of the word and bring forth fruit. But when they do the word, they stumble at the word. And when the word spoke to them in rebuke, they said, what? We repent, right? No, they said, God forbid the prophecy would come to pass. God forbid the three in the message would actually do his work. God forbid that they be reformed, the connection with the three in the message. God forbid that there would be justice and equity in the church. God forbid that there be a spirituality seen and morality. God forbid that the principle of God's word and the revival and reformation he speaks of will come to pass. God forbid that anything will stand in the way of this new organization. Some stumble at the word. Do we see two groups here? Do we see two groups? When we look at these two groups, brothers and sisters, we see that there are individuals who will stumble at the word because of lack of faith or unbelief. And this unbelief in the word caused them to stumble and to have this rock fall upon them. Why? Because they're disobedient. They are unbelievers in the vineyard. They make profession of stewardship, a profession of being husbandmen, but they lack faith. They don't believe in the word. They don't believe in the saving message that only can bring forth fruit in the last days. They believe in the evangelical gospel. 
They believe in a postmodern gospel. They believe in a black liberation gospel. They believe in a social gospel. They don't believe in the everlasting gospel. They don't believe in the saving message for this time. And because of that, they stumble at the word and they cannot build upon this rock. God sees them as unbelievers. God sees them as those that are confounded. To them, Christ is not precious as he is precious to us. Or he let. They stumble at the word being disobedient. Are we still together? So how, for those that truly want to have faith, and some people are even now praying, God, give me that faith. But some are wondering, if we see this connection of the stone and those that truly have faith, how, if we must build upon this rock, how if we must be in connection with this rock and not allow it to fall upon us, how shall we fall upon it? The language of the scripture, the language of the parable is to fall. How do we fall upon this rock how do we fall upon Christ? How do we fall upon the word and be established in it? How do we have faith in the word that all the promises of God may be true in us, that we may be broken yet built, we may be able to bring forth fruit when the time comes for the Son of Man or the beloved Son to be manifested in the church? How do we build upon this rock? The very passage shows us. Look at the text before. Look at 2 Peter, sorry, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. In 2 Peter 2, verse 5, how do we build upon or how do we fall upon this rock? In 2 Peter 2, 5, it says this. <clears throat> 2 Peter 2, 5. Ye also, that means us, as what? Lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God by Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, if we are the lively stones, and we're to be built up a spiritual house. What are we building up upon? What did verse 6 say? A chief cornerstone in Zion. Elect precious. And he that believeth in him shall not be confounded as to how and where the work of building and developing Christian character and God's church really takes place. In other words, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 1 through 5 and 6 and 7, it's showing us that those in the last day will not be confounded to the true spiritual nature of what it means to build upon Christ, to build Christian character in Zion, or to build up God's church. They will not be confounded concerning irregular and regular night. They won't be confounded of what the church is or what constitutes the church. They will have an understanding of this, and this, along with many other principles of the word, they will not stumble at because though they stumble at these truths when they're disobedient taking the prophets and those that are sent to give a message to God and try to cast them out and even they will deny and even try to destroy Christ in his word and his movement in the last day there will be two groups how do we fall upon the rock by being people that believe the word not stumbling at it and building upon the word. They believe every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. They're not saying, God forbid. But God says that he'll take our sin and cast him to death of the sea. Are you saying, God forbid? When God says, come unto me, all you that labor in a heavy land, I'll give you rest. Do you say, God forbid? Many do. Many say, well, you know, I don't know if he means that for me. He meant it for somebody else, but not for me. These people are what? Confounded at the word. When it comes to the idea that God can say, as the psalmist did, Cleanse me with hyssop, purge me with hyssop, and wash me, and I will be clean. They can't believe that word. They don't believe that Jesus came to die for sinners. And because of that, they stumble at the word and end up being righteous and doing right. No, disobedient. Why? Without faith, how could you be obedient? How can you have the power of righteousness or right doing without faith? You cannot build upon the word. The very act of falling on the rock and being broken is an act of faith which is inseparably connected with how God builds up his church. We found out this chief cornerstone is laid where? Zion, God's people, Isaiah 51. The true lively stones or believers are laid upon or built up upon that cornerstone building up a spiritual house. What's the house? It's the church. And this experience of placing yourself and falling upon the word, not stumbling at it, is a work of faith. You must see Christ as he is, elect and precious. You must believe his word. 
not say God forbid, we must be built up. And this is the work, a spiritual work, a work of faith. Believe in the message that causes us to be built up or even to build up God's church. Now, you don't believe that. So let's look at the book of Matthew. Jesus says it again. In Matthew 16, notice again, he shows himself as his chief cornerstone, even a mighty rock. And he says that we must build upon this rock and not just say, well, I'm in the church. Oh, I've been baptized. Oh, I've read some amazing facts. And I, I, no, brothers and sisters. It's much more than some study guides. It's much more than getting into some waters. It's much more than just being around the building or being in the four walls. It's an experience, an act of faith, an act that will cause us to have the Christ of the scripture to be elect and precious. We'll have a new vision. It's called a new birth. And it causes us to have an experience where we will not be confounded the word. The word is a new book to us. It does not confound it. It's joy and peace and more. It's bread and meat to us. It's blood and flesh to us. It feeds those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And in Matthew 16, on this spiritual act of faith, of falling upon the rock and allowing ourselves to be broken, we see a parallel understanding, which is the building up of God's church. Only those that will fall upon the rock will build up God's church. In the last days? No. In every generation, only those that have fallen upon the rock, this rock, this mighty rock, this chief elect rock, only those that fall upon this rock build up God's church. And those will not be confounded. They won't stumble to the word. They won't be found disobedient. They'll be righteous. They'll be righteous by faith and they will act and do righteous. They'll be moved with fear to do a work that will call them to be inheritors of righteousness by faith. Why do you say that? In Matthew 16, Jesus puts it this way. In Matthew 16, Matthew 16, chapter, look at verse 15 through, sorry, 15 through 18. Matthew 16, 15. In Matthew 16, 15 through 18, notice what Jesus says. We know that the Bible says that Jesus was going through the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the disciples, hey, who do men say that I am? And the disciples knew every false doctrine that was going around the self-supporting, you know, circles. Oh, some people say that you are Elijah. And they knew all the nonsense. But did they know by faith? Did they have a work of building? Did they have a revelation? Did they have the, understand, this tried stone, this lively stone, this living stone, this revealed stone? Or was it just a rock? See, those that were disobedient that were builders in the Old Testament, those individuals rejected the chief cornerstone because it didn't seem, on the outward appearance, to be a stone that was great, or a stone that was beautiful, or a stone that was, that was fit their, their own carnal ideas of what it is to be elegant or powerful. They did not look by the spiritual principles of eyes. They looked on the outward appearance. And Jesus says in Matthew 16 concerning who do men say by looking at me, and hearing me that I am, who is really going to be building upon this rock? And look what it says in Matthew 16, 15. Matthew 16 and verse 15, it says this. It said, he said unto him, or unto them, but whom say ye, disciples, that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou, listen carefully, verse 16, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Did he see him as a prophet? They see him as a good man. They see him as just a, a man of Israel. Or they see him as, as going to verse 16, the Christ, that means the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, brothers, we know that this was not even Peter's own thinking or reasoning. How do we know that? Because Jesus says it. Jesus says these thoughts, these words, these, this understanding you have, this revelation is none of you. It came from heaven above. And brothers, I want to show you tonight that only those that have Christ revealed to them can build upon this rock. It's more than just having Bible studies, sitting in a meeting, watching some videos, unless the Spirit of God reveals himself to you and reveals himself, reveals Christ to you, you're still in your sins. You can't be a living stone. You only can be confounded, disobedient, and stumble at the word unless you can come to the point where Christ is revealed to you. You cannot have your lively stone placed upon this cornerstone and build up the house of God with sacrifices acceptable unto God. It's a work of true spiritual vital import to us. We must, in these last days, learn what it is to fall upon the rock 
and be broken. Let's examine that. Let's see whether Peter's words were his own or did it come from a revelation above. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah. You are blessed in the church. Why? Flesh and blood, your own mind, your own heart, your own body, hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In Revelation 1, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, the Father gave unto him, to show unto his servants. Things must shortly come to pass. What we see in Matthew 16 is the same thing we see in Revelation 1. That the Father sends a revelation of Christ to him to give to the service or to the prophets or to his people upon the earth that they may understand that the time is at hand. They may read and hear and keep the word of God. They may be obedient to the word. They may be servants of God. Here it says, my father sent you a revelation that you may see me not as a prophet, not as John the Baptist or Jeremiah or some of the things that the men said that he was. Jesus said, who do you say to him? Peter said, I see you as the revealed Son of God. I see you as a revelation of God's love from above. I see you as the Messiah, the anointed one of God, not as a prophet or even the king of Israel. I see you as a chief, elect, and precious cornerstone. Verse 18, Jesus says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. Peter means a pebble, a little stone. And upon this rock, now is a stone a rock? He started talking about Peter now. He said, your name is Pebble, Stone. I can flick you like a little, a little, a little piece of uh, rock. But upon this rock, and in the Greek, we see that word means Petra. It means a great boulder. Upon this rock, myself, he says, I will build my church. I will put those lively stones. I am the chief cornerstone. And with those that can obtain to this work of revelation, that can have Christ revealed to them, that God reveals himself to the believer because of their faith in him. Those I will place upon this rock. I will place them upon this rock and upon this experience, this truth. This is how the church is built. Without that, who needs conferences? Without that, who needs divisions? Without that, who needs union? Without this experience, what are we organizing? What are we dividing and conferencing and, 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 and division? What are we doing if we don't have this? It can not be anything but a system created to actually attack truth rather than develop it. Unless this work divides itself and multiplies itself, unless this revelation comes to the man or woman seeing Christ in his purity from a divine revelation, how shall the church be built up? How shall he build his church upon this rock? The church is built upon the rock because the church is built upon the revelation of Christ. Without that revelation, without that testimony they're able to bear of God doing this in their heart, shall they be placed upon the rock? No. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church upon this revealed rock. As you've testified of me, as you've revealed me today, upon this experience, under this testimony, upon those with this experience, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Shall not prevail against this experience. Now we can lose the experience. We can lose the experience, but the gates of hell cannot prevail against experience. We can lay hold upon the power of God, but this experience cannot be destroyed. It cannot be overcome. This, this, this experience makes us more. How can be more than a conqueror? Conqueror is a victor, right? The Bible said we can be more than conquerors by or through him that loved us. This is the work by which the church is built up. When people are built upon the Rock, built upon the cornerstone, or they are, in essence, falling or being placed upon by Jesus Christ and by their willingness, by believing by faith, placed upon that rock. Placed upon that rock, brothers and sisters. What is it to fall upon the rock and be broken? But again, someone would say, well, okay, I see what the rock is. I see what even some of this placing or falling on to a certain degree, but it says fall upon the rock and be broken. How can we fall upon the rock, build, and be broken at the same time? Isn't breaking the opposite of building? How can we fall upon the rock, 
or build upon the rock and be broken at the same time. It seems mysterious. But again, Christ used similitudes and symbols to use that we may understand that what we see is not just one, but sometimes two or three. He's showing two or three various things taking place in the experience of the believer at one time. The building and the breaking and the falling represent the full work that must be done for us to not only be placed upon the rock, but to continue upon the rock, to be a part of God's eternal kingdom or be a part of his spiritual body of Christ. Because anyone that comes in any other way than this experience, than the door, than Christ, is a thief and a robber. How are we building but yet broken? What does it mean to be broken? Well, to understand this, again, I hope we under have we understood everything so far? Has it been clear to you? Let's go to the Old Testament now and see how we can understand this idea of being broken now. We understand what the rock is, even the chief cornerstone. We understand what the falling is to a certain degree. It's going to expand in a moment. We understand this idea of building even, which is the same thing as falling, being placed upon and God building up his church by faith, by not stumbling at the word, by being receptive, seeing Christ as elect and precious, believing on him and allowing the word to not cause stumble, but to build us up and allow us to be able to offer sacrifice acceptable to God as living stones. In the book of Deuteronomy, let's turn there, Deuteronomy 30. In Deuteronomy 30, let's put a scripture here that's going to help us understand what actually it means that the breaking of the individual is the means of salvation while the rock falling upon them and grinding the powder is the means of their damnation. How do we understand? What actually, may, the question may be being put more clearer, what actually is being broken? Does it mean being maimed and halt? Does it mean having our physical body broken? What does it mean when it talks about being broken? Or even more clearly, what is being broken? When we look at this parable, if we turn to Deuteronomy 30, turn to Deuteronomy 30, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 30. In the scriptures, we saw in the book of Luke a parable. And that parable dealt with the vineyard at a certain season, supposed to give forth this fruit, and every time the master's servants were turned away without fruit. At last he sends his son at a certain season. We even come in, call it the coming of the Son of Man. And at this coming, the fruit was ready yet still, even when the harvest, but he was taken out of the city and killed. Is that correct? 2,000 years ago. Will the Son come again? Oh, one person, amen. Praise the, uh, thank God for, for waiting for the Lord, okay? Yes, he'll come again. And he's coming again to seek what? Fruit. Are there husbands in place over the vineyard of the church of God, which should be true builders, building them on a true foundation, causing this spiritual experience that we saw, that by which God will build his church to be multiplying the earth, thereby, by that true experience, that true revelation of Christ, those people are building character, building the fruit of the Spirit, so that when Jesus comes, there will not be buildings and hospitals and all these institutions to say, look what we've done. There will be a hard work. When the Son of Man comes again, will he find what? Faith. A fruit of faith in the heart. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproducing his people, or that fruit, then will he come to claim, it's a season, claim them as his own. COL 69. So when we look at this, brothers and sisters, we see that the Bible is showing us a season when the grapes of wrath will be ripe, as well as the harvest of the earth is ripe, Revelation 14. And at that time, Christ comes to do a work. But brothers and sisters, if we look at that, we talked about this need of this fruit being given to the husbandman, but the husbandman at the second advent, we already talked about the first advent, we said the application already, and we saw what happened. At the second advent, the same thing played itself out. And God says he will remove them, destroy them, and give the vineyard to others to bring forth fruit at the 11th hour, you may call it. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're seeing the fulfillment of this parable start to come to pass. We see false prophets and fanatics jump up and claim they have this without the fruit and the character, the evidence, even the experience evangelistically. 
But again, we must examine the fruit. But brothers and sisters, when we look at this parable coming to an end, we see this a parable for the last days. And when we look at the Old Testament, all these parables line up and these prophecies line up. If we know this demon of the last days, when we look at the story and the types of the last days, we can see that every time we see the last days coming up, we're seeing a similar scene in a different story. In Deuteronomy 30, we see a similar scene in a different story. What do I mean by that? The parable of the vineyard, does it deal just with Christ's coming or the first and second coming? How do we know? Because the, the son comes, not just once, he comes looking for fruit. And the same thing will happen because the parable says the same thing will happen, even in a spiritual sense, worldwide sense, the same thing will happen again to Christ or to his message. He will be cast aside. If we know that, then we look at different passages of Scripture where we see a allegorical or a story prophetically or practically that shows us the end of time, we can see also a similar scenario that will unfold for us or give us more understanding of what this scene means. Or what this parable and what this falling on the rock and being broken really means is shared by looking at other passages of Scripture. For instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we see a scene that takes place with the children of Israel. Now remember, who are the stewards of God's vineyard when Jesus comes the second time over his true vineyard to bring forth fruit? What are those people called? What's their name? Adventists. Adventists. Thank you so much. Someone trained you very well. Adventists. As Jews of old, spiritual Israel are God's Adventist church. Amen? Very clear. If this is true, we know that the types that also in the Old Testament that pertain to Moses and Egypt and Israel also pertain to Adventists. Why do we know that? Because Corinthians tells us that those things that happened with Moses and our fathers, they were under the cloud of the sea, are written for our admonition upon what? Whom the ends of the world are come. Just like the parable. Take heed lest ye fall. So these stories in Deuteronomy and so on that show them coming out of Egypt apply to those coming out of Babylon, coming out of the worldly churches and coming into God's Seventh-day Adventist church. It is a parallel. And in Deuteronomy 30, we see that this message was given to the children of Israel as they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And it shows that all the messages connected with those that were going into the promised land that came out of Egypt are just like the messages that are given to take the people in these last days, in Revelation 14, into the spiritual promised land, which is heaven, which is the hereafter. It's the final scenes. The final message is summed up in Deuteronomy 30. And when we look at the message in Deuteronomy 30, it all centers around a heart work. What we've been talking about in all our studies every night has been what? A heart work. A work of faith, a work of prayer and belief and work by faith, but it is a hard work. In Deuteronomy 30, let's see if we can see some parallels between what we see in the three of the message and also in his message of those that are getting ready to go into the promised land. And this warning about guarding their heart, guarding the place where they need to be either sealed or seared, guarding their experience, lest they in their heart, in their profession, in their position as a pastor, in their position as they tread, lest in their heart they turn away from God. God looks not on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God doesn't look at conference and non-conference. God looks at the heart. God doesn't look at whether you claim to be present truth or not. God looks on what? The heart. And this is a summary issue in falling on the rock and being broken. It says this in Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, look at verse 15 through 19. We're almost done. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 through 19. Note the Bible, it says this in verse 15. It says, See, I have set before thee this day what? Life and good, death and evil. That sounds like two groups are going to be formed here. Just like in the parable, two groups are going to be formed. Just as in this message of those going into the promised land, two groups will be formed. It says this. Remember, these things are written upon those in the end times, upon whom the end of the world will come. Verse 16. It says, In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to 
possess it because we keep the commandments of God. We love the Lord. All these are seen principles of the three message. Amen. Verse 17. But if, listen carefully, verse 17. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your seed may do we see that scripture in a different light now? Many people see that scripture and they say, oh, God said before you, blessing and cursing. Do we see now, as reading in that context, that the scripture is dealing with either going to heaven or not? Because it says that, hey, either you will be blessed because you'll keep your heart, and you keep your heart focused on God, keep his commandments, and love him, or you will allow your heart to go after the God and your heart will be taken away and placed upon other gods and you will love other gods. You serve other gods. You will have a love for things of this world and you will not be able to prolong your time in the land which you go to possess. Now the Ten Commandments says, Honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. It's talking about this land. Well, you may say, I might live longer if I honor my father and mother. That may be practically true. But what land is God truly speaking of in the Ten Commandments and Deuteronomy and even in 1 Corinthians? It's talking about the promised land. It's talking about heaven. Meaning that those who allow their heart to be taken away, to be caused to dwell upon and serve other gods, they will not be able to endure in the promise. They will not be able to enter in. And this we see in the story of Moses and the history of Israel. Those that could not enter in lacked what? Hebrews said they lacked faith. That the very thing needed to fall upon the rock and be broken. Now, did they leave Egypt? They crossed the Red Sea? Still didn't have faith, though. The Red Sea was opened by Moses' faith and by the faith of those that put their feet in. And many times, God will allow the faith of some to open the Red Sea, and we'll run in with our, our disbelief, and we'll run in too. We don't believe a way. We say, well, let me go through it before this thing closed down. Excuse me, excuse me, pardon me. Not their faith opened the Red Sea, but yet still they passed through. And various people went through various trials. And some trials destroyed some, and some trials destroyed others. It's amazing to me that Cora, Dathan, and Byron didn't fall with the quail. They were health reformers. But uh, by and by, time revealed that they would not stand the test. And surely, su su surely as it always is, time is the reveal of all secrets. By and by, as it is with disciples of Christ, they went away their own way. They went their own way. Some to serpents, some fell at the quail, some fell at Bell Pure, but there were various temptations to take and snare those who would not fall upon the rock and be broken. Now why are we in Deuteronomy 30? Because again, these lessons parallel. They're also showing us the end of time. What was the issue in Deuteronomy 30? The heart. The heart. Would you have the right heart? The heart, the spirit that Deuteronomy talks about, where it says to have your heart circumcised, to have a different spirit, to have a new heart. Deuteronomy talks about the new heart. And this heart and this conversion and this heart that's not drawn away to go after other gods is a heart that's able to enter into the promised land. It's able to give God its fruit of character. It's able to be saved. But brothers and sisters, those who have their hearts fashioning the things of this world, have their hearts holding on to the things of this world, it's love, it's pride, it's arrogance, all the fashion of this world, all the idols thereof. Can we enter into heaven? Can we even build up God's church with such a heart? Can we? Can we go into God's heavenly kingdom with a heart that loves this world, that loves the things of this world, that has darling sins, that we coddle and hide and hide down deep in our heart 
as Achan of old, we hide in the midst of our tent and we will not let it go. And we won't allow the saving power of that cornerstone, the saving revelation that comes from above. That's even seen the word be profitable. The blood of Christ can cleanse us from every stain of sin. But the Bible says some will be disobedient and they'll stumble at what? The word. Here we see the people of God have a heart problem. And when we look at this idea in the end time and finishing work, which is a, a parallel to Deuteronomy 30, then this falling upon the rock, this building up the church, this final understanding is also what kind of problem? A heart problem. So when we talk about building up, we talk about this stone, what must be broken? The heart. The heart must be broken. You say, well, that's your own interpretation. No, the Bible says over and over and over again that the work of the gospel and the finishing of the work is tied inseparably with not a proud and blasphemous heart, but a broken heart. And by this, we're able to fall upon the rock and have the love of the fashion of this world, love of the habits and, and action of the world, love of the innuendo and immorality of this world, we have these things broken up and we're able to have a new heart and even the Christ to dwell within us, to say, thou art the Christ, even my Messiah, the Son of the living God. We're able to testify upon this experience, God will build his church. Only those who have this heart work, has your heart, brothers and sisters, been broken? Have you fallen upon the rock and been broken? Mm. Now you say, well, hmm, how could that be? Broken? Well, again, don't forget the scripture we just looked at in 1 Peter. Shall we go back to 1 Peter? Remember, this experience is also seen as building upon the rock. How do we get built upon the rock? Only by having this heart Broken. Those that fall upon the rock are broken. What falls upon the rock or placed upon the rock? Lively stone. Hmm. How do we get to be a lively stone? We must have this heart broken. Without the breaking of the heart that the Holy Spirit may come in, we're not living or lively stone. And we can't be placed upon that cornerstone. We can't take our quarrying space in the temple of God. We may be around the church. We may have positions. We may even preach. But we have not truly been set and hewed and squared and placed in the building so that we can stand immovable. As a matter of fact, we talk about this experience that is also the breaking. It's also the building. It's also the falling. All this, Peter in first, let's look at it. I'm not going to preach it. Let's look at it. First Peter 2. We just read it, but we didn't see it. This experience is what sacrifice God truly wants. Have we studied about sacrifices before? and the sacrifices of God, the Bible says that this experience is the sacrifice that God truly wants. The sacrifices that even are like unto Christ's sacrifice. Christ gave a sacrifice, a one sacrifice, all for once and for all. But we are to give in love and response to this truth and in faith, a sacrifice as well. And this experience we're talking about tonight is a sacrifice that God can accept. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 it says this. Look, look at it. We read it before. 1 Peter 2 5 says this. 1 Peter 2 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house because the Spirit of God can come into a broken heart. And holy priesthood, listen here, to offer up what? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God by Jesus Christ. Christ and the stone of Jesus Christ and God can accept us as living stones upon Jesus Christ because of this experience because we've had our heart broken up from these darling sins these false gods these strange idols that we love in this world today thou should have no other gods before me let's prove that the broken heart is the true sacrifice that God wants to be placed upon this chief cornerstone, breaking and building and allowing a people to even build the temple of God. Let's see some text in the book of Psalm, Psalm 51. Let's see if this true experience, this breaking of the heart, this breaking of the stone and placing it is the very experience that we need in these last days and the sacrifice that God can accept. In Psalm 51 it says this, it's the sacrifice that God can accept. In Psalm 51 it says this, Psalm 51, Psalm 51 and verse 17. 
Psalm 51, the 51st division of the psalm, and verse 17. Say amen when you have it. Amen. Psalm 51, 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a what? A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not. He will accept it. Let your heart fall upon the rock and be broken. Let the vision and understanding who Christ is, his purity, his holiness, his idea of truth break off. The sins that we so easily are beset by cause our heart and mind to thrill with the joy of his love and peace. Allow the sacrifice of Christ and the blood thereof to be applied to you. You say you love this world? Well, you need the blood of Christ to awaken and anoint your eyes. You say you are bound by certain sins you seem to can't get a victory over? You must need the blood of Christ. You must need the blood of Christ anointed and applied to you. This blood will anoint your eyes. This blood will anoint your body. Two copious streams came out the side of the Savior upon the cross. Two copious streams. One of blood and one of water. Blood to wash away our sin, even in a legal sense, but even in a literal sense. But also water to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not only can we be forgiven of our sins, but that water can cleanse us that our desire for sin, Amen. our desire, our desire, the, the un, unbreakable power that causes us to actually act and do things we know are not right can be cleansed. This is the process of falling upon the rock and being broken. You say, how could it be a process I can go through? You got to believe it. Only those that have faith can see the elect and precious stone as a building place, as a truth, as an elect and precious example that causes us to want to be placed upon that stone, to be put in the building. Causes us to want to have this heart breaking, this breaking off of sin. The Bible says a sacrifice that God can accept is a broken and contrite spirit. The Holy Spirit will call to have sorrow for sin. But if you feel sorry for sin, if your conscience is bothering you, and God can also do the second word. If he can bring you to conviction of sin, if he can make you feel sorry for sin, then can't you believe that he can also break your heart and break off these sins? He can do both work. There are two copious streams that came from Christ's side, one of blood, one of water. But again, look at the book of Psalm 34. Psalm 34. It goes on and on and on through scripture. On and on, on and on, the psalmist says that this is the true sacrifice that God wants and this is the understanding we need in these last days. Are we in Psalm 34? Amen. Psalm 34 and verse 17. Psalm 34, verse 17 through 19. Psalm 34 and verse 17 knows again the word of God. Psalm 34, 17 says the righteous cry. Who are the righteous? Who are the righteous? Let's see. Let's see who the righteous are. Because we found out who God will accept, who sacrifice God will accept. Amen? But let's see who the righteous are. In Psalm 34, 17, it says, The righteous cry, and the Lord what? Heareth and delivereth them out of all their... Are oh, you having some trouble tonight? The Bible said that God will hear and deliver you. Knows what it says. Because you said, well, the righteous only those that just seem to have everything right. Knows who the righteous are. Verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken, broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of oh. It's not your righteousness because you have no temptation. It's that you can be delivered out of them all. Sometimes you might fall. But if you fall, you have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. You've taken your eyes off the, off the prize. The righteous man falls seven times and getteth up again. Amen. Don't stay down. Get back up and get back in the fight because only those that allow this work of being broken will eventually be healed, will eventually be saved. The righteous are heard when they cry. Why are the righteous crying? They're in afflictions. They're in temptation and trials. They're seeing all these problems saying, man, I wonder if I'm right because I'm seeing having all these problems. You're having problems because Satan sees that you're on the verge of victory. And you must press and believe that the work that you're feeling and seeing, that, that heat. You know, a stone must be quarried. A stone needs to be chiseled. And that's pressure. That's heat. That's, 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 that's uh, aggression. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violence taken it by force. Are you accepting the chastening of the Lord? Those whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and rebuked to square them for the building. Let's go on in the book of Psalm again, Psalm 147. 
Psalm 147, over and over again, the psalmist tells us this broken heart, this contrite spirit is what God wants. And by the spirit, if we have faith, God will bring this contrition, this sorrow for sin. And also he will break the heart. He will break up the fallow ground. He will break up the condition that are caused to be not only in inherited sin, but cultivated habits of sin. Cherish sin, the love and desire for it will be broken up. Temptation may come, but the love and desire for it. There was a time where sin, I'll be trying to 147, Psalm 147. There was a time when sin would come to our mind, immediately we'd do it. We wouldn't think about it. Why? Because we were in the world and we were moved and, and actuated by the prince of the power of this air. We were guided by the prince of this world. And the lust of our father, we would do. But now, there seems to be a war. There's a controversy going on where you desire to do right, but you can't. And this experience is showing that God is working upon the heart. Else, why would you even think or know something was sin and have some controversy with it? We must believe that the same God who is convicting us of sin, right in judgment, is showing us evidence of whose power? The Holy Spirit. I'll say, oh, I'm so convicted of all my sins. God can't be with me. Well, obviously, he's sending you an email showing you that he's with you because he's showing you the conviction of sin, right and judgment by the Holy Spirit. There's still work. And if he can send this work of conviction, he's trying to lead you to the Savior. But many don't look or that stone is presented to them as the source or the solution to this problem and they disallow it. The builders that disallowed the stone. Oh, Jesus? Well, yeah, I heard people talking about Jesus. Keep my eye on Jesus, but you know, <laughs> I just don't know if I can do that. Are you convicted of sin? Yes. Convicted of righteousness? Yes. Well, you need to turn to Christ, and as you study the word, believe that these promises will cleanse and heal you. Don't take it as, as, as literature. Take it as the word of God to your soul. Take it as bread and water. Believe that these things can be, that this blood can be applied to you. Well, you know, is that right? It is righteousness. It's not only right, it's righteous. And God came not to save, sin, to save the, the righteous, but sinners. Bring sinners to repentance. And the work of the Holy Spirit is trying to bring you to repentance. Believe upon Him. Believe upon Him. Don't disallow the stone. Allow the work to continue. Don't be stumbling at the word. Believe it. And by faith, allow these words to break up the fallow ground. To break up your heart. Fall upon this rock and be broken. Psalm 147 in verse 3 says this. Psalm 147, 7 and 3. It says, it says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds, all the wounds that sin has made, God can bind up. Talk with a brother today, dear brother. He said, you know, I, 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 I thank you for calling my call. You know, I, I, I've been struggling, you know, and I, I fell back and I, I started drinking again. I said, well, brother, trying to come back is not easy. I said, what kind of pastor? Trying to come back is not easy. Falling away and trying to come back is not easy. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Writer, the author and finisher of our faith. We have a high priest sitting upon the right hand of God in the heavens. And even though this may be our condition now, the righteous man falleth how many times? Seven, seven times. Falleth? Seven times. And getteth up again. We are seeing in the scriptures examples of individuals who have fallen and show forth true repentance. Show forth to true putting away of sin. Not saying they believe that they have repented and they're doing the same thing again. That's again showing that you are still in the flesh. These individuals get back up again. Why? Because if any man sin, he had an advocate with the Father. Get back up. Allow that great advocate to plead for you, to cleanse, to strengthen you. Allow the word to do his work. Fall upon the rock and be broken. The Bible says he'll do what to those that are broken in heart? Healeth them and bindeth up their wounds. What about Isaiah? Have you seen what Isaiah said? Isaiah was very bold. Look what Isaiah says in Isaiah 57. We're almost done. Isaiah 57. 
And Isaiah 57, the word of God shows us that Isaiah knew of this teaching, this experience. And not only did David show him this, but he experienced it for himself. And he added to this truth in Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Isaiah 57, who does God dwell with? And who in whom will God dwell? It says in Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Isaiah 5, 7, 1, 5. Isaiah 57, 15. It says, for thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Notice it says, I dwell in eternity in the high and holy place. It says with, hmm, wait a minute, with? How can you dwell in the high and holy place and seemingly between all this mist and shadow and you with somebody? Notice what it says. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also. That is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. He's in the heavenly sanctuary above doing a work even for our hearts tonight if we believe and allow all these sins that so easily beset us to be broken up by the word. Don't stumble by the, at the word. Fall upon the rock. Don't stumble fall. Maybe I should have titled that sermon tonight that. Don't stumble, fall. Because those that stumble at the word allow the rock to fall upon them. A reality prophetically of the last days. And those that allow themselves by faith to see and not reject this stone, but see Christ as a savior. Not as a prophet, not as a great man, not as a miracle worker, but as the savior of the world and a savior for my personal sins, if they could see and believe that these promises that he spoke to this blind man and to this paralytic and to this person in sin are also able to save to the uttermost, even me in 2018 to come to him by, by faith, then this truth, this experience, is you not stumbling at the word. You know you stumble at the word? When you disallow the fact that that cornerstone is still building today. Oh, that promise he gave to him, well, that was to him. I wish he could come and heal my blindness. I wish you can help, help me. My, I'm paralyzed. I wish you would let me free from sin too. Those promises are still good today. They're still good today. Didn't Jesus speak a word to that centurion about his daughter? And even though that daughter was not even there, well, the centurion, they're carrying his, I'm sorry, but well, one was a daughter, one servant, carrying his servant. Let's say, let's say that one. When he carried the, he had his servant in his hand and say, will you please speak a word over? No, no, no. The servant was home. Jesus spoke the word there and all the way where the servant was, the servant was what? Healed. Jesus spoke those words 2,000 years ago and all the way down here in 2018, we can be healed. We can be changed. We can have the Holy Spirit. Do the, the, there's no shelf life. It's not like the milk, soy milk, in your refrigerator. It doesn't go bad. Those promises never lose their power. You ever read some of that song? It will never lose its power. It's talking about the Word. It can't lose its power. And we can even today with these same promises fall upon the word, fall upon the rock and be broken. What sin beset you so easily? The Bible says that God dwells with those that will allow this contrite heart to be broken. Allow God to do his perfect work. You can't do it, but God can. You say, but I can't seem to get the victory over this. God can. Place it before God. Put your finger on the text where God has promised to give you victory. That he'll give you love, joy, peace, temperance, all these things. He will do it. He that's able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. To, uh, to him be glory and dominion. Dominion over what? Everything that liveth. Just like the first Adam, the second Adam should have dominion over everything. Are you living? He has dominion over you. If you allow, if you have faith. And brothers and sisters, in Luke 4, what did Jesus say? He said, the Spirit, Luke 4, Luke 4, what, 4, 18? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the what? Broken hearted. The purpose of the gospel, the purpose of Christ coming into the world, even the purpose of the anointing is to heal the broken hearted. Can you receive the word tonight? 
Can you believe the word tonight? Tonight can you receive the word? Can you allow, even by, not by actually tripping, but by faith and not stumbling at disobedience to the word and believing the word, can you fall upon the rock and be broken? See, falling upon the rock and the broken is the opposite of disbelieving the word. It's the opposite of failing to recognize the power and chief elect nature of Christ and to see him as a savior. Allowing him to save, believing his power is falling the rock and being broken. The act of faith of choosing to believe the scripture and allowing yourself to see Christ as he is. I've never seen a revelation of Christ. What do you think this whole Bible is? It's revelations of Christ. And revelations of his exceeding great and precious promises that by these might be partakers of the divine nature. How? By allowing that word to not cause a stumble. That word to break up our heart. That we may become obedient. Know you not to whom ye yield yourselves. Servants to obey even the word. Not stumbling at it. To him you obey. Whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. It's like a servant. Amen? It's not like the 144,000. They're all servants. Amen? You don't believe that, do you? Do you believe that? That's why in Deuteronomy 30 it told us that all this scene is a type of the people that will go into the promised land. The people that go into the promised land are those in this last day that are sealed, the servants of God. They're sealed in their forehead or sealed in their heart. They are the same people that got the victory over pride. They thought themselves rich and increased with good and having need of nothing, but God showed them their self-deception. Tonight, are we self see. Have we thought ourselves even greater than we are? Have we thought ourselves able to be, able to be good Christians while holding on to our pride and our doubt and our darling sins and our arrogancy and our lack of faith? Can we not have our hearts broken up tonight? Can we believe that God would do that? Because again, there's two options, brothers and sisters. Either we can believe Jesus is a Savior, and He is, and His blood is powerful, and it is. And believe Him as the author and finisher of our faith, meaning He's begun a good work, and he will complete it. Stay in the word. Be don't just read the promises. Believe the promises. You have to, if you have to stay there and pray with your finger on the text all night. Oh, oh, oh. 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 My finger's still there. Huh? Brother and sister, if you fall asleep, hey, the flesh is weak. Wake up and pray again. Tarry. Believe. Don't disallow. The stone's purpose and work. Believe that he has the power to hold up and build the church of God. Even build up you and place you. He wants you to be placed there. You must believe. Now, brothers and sisters, again, I can't leave without a warning. Can't leave without a warning because when we look at Daniel chapter 2. Look at Daniel 2. Are we in the Old Testament? Look at the book of Daniel. In Daniel 2, we see even in the prophecy to the end, this parallel prophecy. The parables show prophecy. They show the same thing we saw in Exodus, sorry, Deuteronomy, the same thing we saw as message for the last days. Because the parable said there'll be two groups. One would be able to take the vineyard in the place of the, faith, the, the, the unjust steward and go on to bring them forth fruit. The other would be destroyed or ground to powder. Remember that? Because they would not allow the rock to be a place where they will fall, the rock will fall upon them. We see it all through the prophecies. In Daniel 2, it says this. Daniel 2 and verse 34 and 35. We've read this many times, but look, again, look at it in the light of this message tonight. In Daniel 2, 34, Daniel 2, 34 says this. Look and see if we see the same thing. Daniel 2, 34 and 35. It says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and of clay, and break them to pieces. Now, brothers, remember the metals and the clay represent the church and the world. It's not just the world's going to be destroyed, it's also the miry, unfaithful member of the church that will not allow this work of faith to be done in their hearts and bring forth fruit. Verse 35 says this, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces broken to powder together and became as the chaff of the summer threshing floor. What's the chaff? It's the powder. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole... Is that a prophecy of the last days? Yes. It's the same thing we saw 
in Luke 10. Two groups. Two groups. We see it again in Revelation 6. Look at Revelation 6. We see these two groups again. And Revelation 6 says this. In Revelation 6, we see a people that at the close of probation, as Jesus is coming, the son, the beloved son, comes to find fruit. And what they do? They make the decision. When the son comes to receive the fruit of the vineyard, should they say, hey, let's fall on the rock and be broken? No, they say, hey, you know what? We, we, let the, we let that rock fall on us. They say it. Both practically and spiritually, they make the decision. And so we see today, decisions are about to be made. And Revelation 6 says this. Revelation 6, verse 15 and 17. 15 to 17. Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17. Are we in Revelation 6, 15? Amen. And the kings of the earth. Revelation 6, 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks and the mountains, and said to the mountains, and the what? Rock. The rocks or stones. Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who is he to sit upon the throne? The chief cornerstone. They make the decision. We will not surrender to this. We don't believe this message. We don't believe this everlasting gospel. We don't believe in these messages, these reforms, or this type of righteousness that causes us to get away from sin. No. Hey, we, we make our choice. Hey, just fall on us. And soon, brothers and sisters, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. It'll be too late tonight. As Deuteronomy 32 says, I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. The falling upon the rock or stumbling at the word and being ground to powder. Shall we look at one last text? Look at what Christ says. This is our last text. Look at Matthew 7. Oh, brothers and sisters, as we've been studying night after night, return to Matthew 7. We need to understand this falling upon the rock and it's connected with going into our secret closet. We studied that. It's connected with hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Have we studied that? Yes. It's connected with seeking the Lord where it might be found. It's all connected. Seeking, knocking, asking. In Matthew 7, notice our closing text. And notice the, the warning of Christ which sounds down to our day. Have you heard what we've looked at in a spiritual ear tonight? Have you believed what we've looked at today? Yes. Has the Spirit of God convicted you and also prayerfully done the work of conversion because you believe the word? And you continue to look at the promises and apply them by faith to you. Thereby, falling upon the rock and being broken. It's a work of faith, brothers and sisters. And in Matthew 7, Jesus says this, Even to this last generation, even to those who have heard this message tonight, from now to the end of time, Jesus' words are, this, are thus. Matthew 7, verse 24 to 28. In Matthew 7, verse 24, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken them unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it's founded upon a rock. It's the same thing we saw in Matthew 16, and in 1 Peter, it's the same message, because the church is going to have storm and tempest, and it's going to sweep away some structure, but not this one. Amen. Verse 26, Everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. You ever heard the wise and foolish version? It all comes together. All these parables connect in some way. The foolish said, hey, now I'm going to build my house where? Upon. Now, brothers, what, was, what happened to those that were not faithful? They were ground to powder or sand. Some built their experience upon falling upon the rock or building upon it, and some built their experience upon what was going to be grind them to power. They're built upon the sand. Here again we see this parable's imagery used again to reinforce it. It says some built their house or their church upon an experience where they stumbled at the word. They're disobedient and they do not choose to allow the saving power of the gospel to bring forth fruit in the final generation. The rock or the sand. The experience that God says that gates of hell will not prevail against. And that which storm and tempest will sweep away the structure, according to selected messages. Verse 27 said, the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when it came to pass, when Jesus ended these saying, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribe. Brothers and sisters, many of those that were astonished at his doctrine were lost. 
Many of those that were astonished at the doctrine said, crucify him. Many of those that were astonished at the doctrine in 70 AD were destroyed in the conflagration and the siege. We must not be astonished at the doctrine. We must fall upon the rock. Not stumble at the word. Fall upon the rock. Have our hearts broken and be saved. Shall we pray, Father? In our message tonight, we've seen amazing truths that really show us our great need of thee, our need of faith, our need of going in that secret closet and placing our finger upon the scriptures. That by these exceeding great and precious promises, we might be partakers of the divine nature. Lord, I believe. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief, which cause us to disallow Christ as a savior from all sin, to disallow him as a healer of our diseases, to disallow him as a redeemer, as a friend, as a merciful, loving high priest. Help us not to disallow him, but to run to him and receive of him from grace to grace, to daily drink and eat of the Son of Man, to drink in the power of his word, to believe and to believe unto everlasting life. Lord, you said that waters that spring up to everlasting life will come from our bellies. Lord, fill us. Give us that bread that we want no more. Fill us with that living water. Lord, we know thou hast not where to draw from earthly wells, but that spiritual water. We desire it, Lord, more than the woman at the well. We desire in this last generation, this final church, desires that water more than ever before. Feed us, ere or lest we die, tonight, by faith, and strengthen us, that in that meat we can go 40 days, or go on to perfection. We ask, we pray, and we thank you for this revelation tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.